Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Space Telescope Science Institute Public Lecture Series. We have a special presentation for you tonight. This is not the first Tuesday of the month. It is actually the last Tuesday of the month, but we have a special workshop going on here at Space Telescope this week. And uh, the organizers of the workshop were grateful or, or gracious enough to be able to find one of their speakers who was coming to the workshop anyways, who is also a wonderful public speaker, and come and give us a public talk tonight. That does not mean we won't have our usual May lecture. Uh, next Tuesday night, Bonnie Meinke will be talking about the making of moons. She is an expert on Saturn, and I gotta say, Saturn has some of the really coolest moons in the solar system. All right, and she's got some really cool stuff to tell us about uh, how moons form and how moons interact with the rings of Saturn. All sorts of really cool stuff. I'm a, I am love sat the, these Saturn talks, so you're, you're not going to want to miss that one. That will be next Tuesday, May 6th at 8 p.m. And at that time, I will do my normal news from the universe where I tell you the latest discoveries from Hubble and other missions around. Uh, I, as always, I never bring one of the uh, lithographs. Uh, if you did not get a lithograph, oh, thank you. I always forget to can't bring these. If you did not get a lithograph, they are on the table over there. Pick one up on your way out. Tonight's lithograph is 30 Doradus, a turbulent star forming region, which has a really, really cool picture on the front. And if you want to understand a little bit about that really cool image, turn over on the back and we have I believe we're allowed 330 words on these lithographs because I've, I've written a bunch of these lithographs and I'm allowed exactly, you know, no more than 330 words. So as much as we can say about it in 330 words uh, on the back. Thank you very much. So I won't be doing any of that tonight. Um, it's raining tonight, so we will not have our telescope across the street. Uh, Duncan Watts had sent me an email saying, hey, I'm willing to do it if it's clear. It's not clear. So uh, you'll have to come back next week and maybe it'll be clear and you can do the observing in the telescope across the street. So we'll go straight to our main feature tonight without any delay. And our main feature is Dr. David Grinspoon uh, talking on Terra Sapiens, the human chapter in the history of Earth. Uh, Dr. Grinspoon is a visiting scholar at the Library of Congress, and he was the inaugural chair in astrobiology, which has some really fancy complex name that I didn't bother to memorize, <laughs> but he can tell you all about that. Uh, but showing that the field of astrobiology, which was this melding of astronomy and biology, and was considered kind of funky and crazy about uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, is now getting a major respect and is a major field, and he is one of the leaders in it. He is also a professor at the University of Colorado. Now he is involved in a lot of things in planetary science. He is a co-I on the instrument on the Mars rover Curiosity. So his experiment is on Mars, on the surface of Mars. He is also involved in the European Space Agency's Venus Express which is currently orbiting Venus. So he's got two of the planets covered, okay? Um, you know, by the end of his career, he'll have the, he'll have the full suite. Uh, he is a prolific writer, writing for uh, various magazines, including doing the Cosmic Relief column for Space and Science, Sky and Telescope. Uh, he is author of several noted books, which have won various prizes that I didn't memorize. And one of the, the coolest things is that in 2006, he was awarded the Carl Sagan Medal for Public Communication of Planetary Sciences. So with that kind of resume, <laughs> with that kind of resume, you know it's going to be a good talk. I'm looking forward to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Oh! I also have to note, and it's, on, oh, it's, it's sort of cut off. He is also, I, he also, uh, has, if you want to find out more, you can go to www.funkyscience.net, or you can follow him on Twitter as Dr. Funky Spoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Grinspoon. <laughs> appreciate it, especially uh, given the fact that it's a rainy night here in Baltimore, and um, there's also an important NBA playoff game. <laughs> and 
the fact that you've chosen to be here with me, I'm gratified. And I only ask in return that if you know the score, you don't tell me because I'm going to try to watch. Oh, is it? It's not on. Do I need to push a button? Yes. Ah, give me a moment. You're missing all my witticisms. <laughs> Now watch while I do this gamely effort to... What do I do? Oh, I haven't used this one. Oh, what about this? It says push. Yeah, it's green. Did that work? <laughs> Alright. How many astrophysicists does it take to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> rocket, rocket scientists in the house? Yeah. Anyways, yeah, so if you know the score of the uh, Bulls-Wizards game, don't tell me so I can watch it. <laughs> um, later. And uh, also a big hello to any of you watching on the internet tonight. Hi mom, hi dad. <laughs> and at least I, I know those of you watching on the web are, are watching the basketball game at the same time. That's what I'd be doing. Or you're like, oh, a time out. Quick, let's watch some astrobiology. Um, <laughs> all right. Anyways, so Terra Sapiens, the human chapter in the history of Earth. What am I, an astro, a mere astrobiologist, doing talking about this? Well, it all began when I saw an advertisement for this kind of unusual job that was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, a couple years ago, I saw that there was a new position being established for a chair of astrobiology in the Library of Congress, jointly supported by NASA and the library. And they were specifically, and, and that kind of caught my attention. I said, wait, what, what are they talking about? A chair of astrobiology at the li library? I've never heard of such a thing. And then I read the fine print, and it said they were specifically looking for somebody to do sustained research at the intersection between the science of astrobiology and its humanistic and societal aspects. And I thought, huh, maybe that's an opportunity to write that book I've been thinking about and had back burnered for the last several years about human civilization as a sort of almost astrophysical or cosmic phenomenon. And so I already had a proposal in the works, which I reformatted in the proper form for this proposal and added some other things and sent it in. And I was very gratified to be selected as the inaugural astrobiology chair. And the title of my proposal that I submitted was this. Astrobiology and the Anthropocene Era, Exploring the Potential Roles of Life and Intelligence on Earth and Beyond. Well, what are we talking about here? So astrobiology, as some of you I'm sure know, is the scientific study of life in the universe. So we study very carefully the record and history of life on Earth and the extremes of life on Earth, trying to understand the limits and universals of life. And we also study the environments in the rest of the universe to try to extrapolate and understand where the universe may be life friendly. And so that's the field of astrobiology. The Anthropocene is a new term that is becoming to be widely used, which I'll talk about a lot tonight, but it's the idea that we in fact have now entered a new era or phase of geologic history of the earth defined by the actions of human beings as a major geological force. It's not a value judgment. It's not necessarily saying this is good, this is bad. It's just recognizing that if you add up what humans are doing now, it is comparable to the other great forces of nature. So my idea was to look at this Anthropocene era from an astrobiology point of view. And that's what I've been doing for the last year. And I'll summarize a little bit of that for you this evening. So. The Anthropocene, as I said, it's the time, it's the word that's now being used and it's in fact been proposed as an official term in the geologic time scale. That proposal is now up for review and being considered, but it's also come to be widely used whether or not it gets officially um, sanctified as, as, as a geological term. And it's, it's the, the idea is that we've become a dominant force of planetary change. And there are many interesting ways of looking at this. And one way is to look at the different ways we measure time. We think of geological time over here on the left. We think of the history of life, biological time. And we think, of course, of history, the, the, uh, the, the history of civilization. 
And in a sense, with the Anthropocene, we're realizing that these have all become braided together, perhaps irreversibly, that in a certain sense, there may be no more history without geology and vice versa. So people have been looking at this, and there's a lot of data on this, and I'm not going to I'm going to go through this part very quickly because it's not my goal here to convince you that humans, in fact, have become a dominant force. I think you're probably aware of a lot of this. But just to summarize, if you look at so many, these are all different indicators of human presence on Earth. And certainly if you look at your population and things like uh, damming of rivers, what we've been doing to the water cycle, the hydrological cycle of Earth, here's a weird fact that there is now more water in reservoirs behind dams on Earth than in all the natural flowing streams and rivers on Earth by a factor of five or six more water in behind dams. So that's not a minor effect we've had on the hydrological cycle. Similarly, you can look at so many of these other indicators. And, and here's sort of a funny, facetious one, McDonald's restaurants. But it actually is an indicator of fertilizer use. We're really changing the nitrogen cycle of the planet with this. And the interesting thing is that you, you can see a common form to all of these. You know, they're not exactly the same, but you can see a similarity. And in particular, there's this big jump post-war around 1950 in a lot of them. And that's something that scholars of the Anthropocene called the Great Acceleration. And there's different ideas as to why that happened, but a lot of it had to do with a, the sort of suppression of a lot of activity during the wars and then the explosion after that. So this, these are all indicators of human presence on the Earth. And then this next slide, I'll show you one more slide of data. These are all indicators of the sort of human effects on Earth systems. So the obvious ones, CO2, of course, going up and other atmospheric gases and, um, you know, ozone you know about. Um, different climate indicators, the, the number of great floods, biodiversity changes. And again, you see a lot of this sort of, you know, they're not identical because there's this complex system, but you see this common form with a great acceleration in a lot of these. So there's, there's really no doubt that we are having this massive effect on our planet. So what is the context through which we should think about this? Well, as an astrobiologist, I'm drawn to thinking about things in terms of the really big picture in terms of cosmic evolution. And by the way, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm here this week for this extraordinary meeting. It's been so interesting. It's, it's a, a, a workshop here, a symposium here at the Space Telescope Science Institute called um, Habitable Worlds, Habitable Worlds Across Time and Space. And it's so interesting because people are talking about all these different things that are, that are represented here in this cartoon about galaxy formation and star formation and planet formation and where you might get life in the universe and even the evolution of complex life. So on this, on this, this, this is a one-page cartoon history of the entire uh, universe, but it's meant to point out when we think of cosmic evolution, we think of sort of the major transitions that the universe has gone through, especially in terms of the way matter is organized. And so obviously, originally you had the Big Bang and they formed galaxies. And then in these magnifying glasses is sort of what's happening on the micro scale. So you start getting you, the, um, the, the galaxies and stars give birth to the, the elements. And then you get simple organic molecules in um, interstellar clouds and the, the environments around young stars. And then on the surfaces of at least some planets, you get more complex molecules. And at least on one planet, we had an origin of life. And then organic molecules frolicking in the primordial glop of a young Earth. And voila, here we have the evolution of complex life and what we so perhaps vainly call civilization. And it ends here with uh, question marks and, uh, about what's next. Because why should we assume that this is the apotheosis of cosmic evolution, what we've got going on right here. But the other thing I'll point out is that part of what we're driven to do in astrobiology is try to understand how universal these processes are. So everything on the left side of this cartoon is known to be universal. There are galaxies and stars formed everywhere in the universe. And we're driven to wonder if these things on the right side are also similarly phenomena that are widespread and not just unique to this location. Now, the great news, of course, in the last 
decade or two is that now we know that planet formation is in fact common, I would say universal. We didn't know this even really a decade ago to the way that we know it now with, with the wonderful Kepler mission and the other discoveries you've been hearing about, but now you know when you look up at night at the stars that most of them, almost all of them, have planets and a sizable percentage of them probably have planets that in some significant ways resemble our planet. So that is new and profound. We're moving some things into this column of the, that we wonder about how universal they are to, in fact, knowing that they're universal, but we're still on the trail of these last two developments, life and complex life. That's what we're driven to understand. Now, the story here locally began about 4.6 billion years ago with a process we call accretion, where this disk of dust and gas around the young sun went through this process of, of congealing and conglomeration and falling together of larger and larger objects and more and more violent collisions. So there was this crashing and bashing and smashing and a sort of demolition derby and that as, as the objects got larger, their gravitational pull got larger and their forces between them got larger. And, and the, so the final stage was quite violent collisions, including the, the late collision that, uh, where, where a very large object hit the Earth and, and splashed material into orbit, which made our moon. And that was sort of the end of accretion, really, other than just a little mopping up. So it was really this gravitational accretion that formed the planets. Now, I'm going to skip some steps and, and rush ahead about four and a half billion years, but <laughs> something remarkable has happened on one of those planets. If you had been watching Earth, say you were a patient alien watching Earth for all of these billions of years, you would have noticed a lot of activity in the interim. Say you were watching the night side of Earth it would have been pretty dark throughout most of that period. Yeah, you would have seen the occasional flash of lightning, the occasional splash of, of aurora, the northern and southern lights. And then more recently, in the last few hundred million years, once the continents got forested, you would see the occasional forest fire. Maybe once in a while you'd see a glowing volcano. But in general, the night side would have been very dark. And then very recently, to your alien eyes, something really remarkable would have happened. And these networks of lights, these glowing areas, would have sprung up first on some of the coastal areas and then the little filaments of roads between those inhabited coastal areas. And you would have said, wow, something new and remarkable is happening on this planet. And undeniably different. And not only that, but if you were a very observant alien just in the last 50, 60 years, you would have noticed a curious anti-accretion where a few little bits of the planet started <laughs> flying back off out into space in seeming defiance of the laws of gravity and going back out to the other planets and sending radio signals back. And so it's a curious anti-accretion in two senses of the word. It's curious in that it would be very strange if you didn't understand what was going on, but it's also the hallmark of curiosity a species on this one planet has started to send emissaries to the rest of the solar system asking questions, seeking information about origins and context. So there's a lot one can say about what we've learned through comparative planetology, and that's actually my day job in, to the extent that it, that it could be considered a day job. Um, and um, so to, summar up, to uh, summarize sort of a, you know, a life's work in, in one slide, one thing we've learned through, through this study, in particular through studying the trio of Venus, Earth, and Mars, which is very compelling because these are the two planets that seem to start out Earth-like and then go off in their own directions. What we've learned is that, surprisingly, these planets seem to have very similar origins in early environments. You've heard all about the early water on Mars. We're still learning more about that, but there's a lot of evidence that Mars was a warmer, wetter place when it was young. And Venus, too, we think, had, had oceans and a sort of warm, friendly surface environment when it was young. We've got to do a lot more exploring to really get that story straight. But that's what we think. They had similar origins. And so it may be that the conditions for the origin of life are common. 
that rocky planets start out that way and start out with similar conditions to those that on Earth seem to facilitate the origin of life. And it may be that what's rare is the persistence of a habitable planetary environment over, over cosmological timescales, over billions of years. So it seems like Earth, under, compared to its neighbors, went down a different path. There was an early divergence, an origin of life, which has had profound effects on the further evolution of the planet. In fact, uh, my, co my colleague, Colin Goldblatt, at a recent meeting put it this way. He said, the, the defining characteristic of Earth is planetary scale life. And Earth teaches us that habitability and inhabitants are inseparable. In other words, the more we study the Earth, the more we realize that, Earth has, uh, that life has really got Earth in its clutches in a deep way. Obviously, it's changed the atmosphere. It's changed the look of Earth from space. It's changed the hydrological cycle, but even more and more now we're realizing it's changed the rocks and the minerals. We heard a great talk about that today, that, that Earth has three times the mineral diversity because of life. Uh, there's the range and number of minerals that, that the chemistry of life does to it, that it would have if it was a lifeless planet. It's even changed the interior properties of the planet. So, so life, it was this early branching point, and then subsequently, for nearly four billion years, Earth has been evolving under the influence of global forces that have seemingly not been at work on our neighboring planet. So there was a branching point. And what I'm interested in is the possibility that what we're going through now, the Anthropocene, looked at in terms of cosmic evolution and the kinds of things that can happen to planets, maybe in a certain sense another branching point. More recently, as illustrated here by this illuminated night side Earth, Earth has come under the influence of a new type of geological force, the global activities of humanity defining the Anthropocene. So again, I want to sort of try to present a context to think about that. Now, we are not the first species, the first kind of life to come along and profoundly change the Earth. In fact, the most extreme transition ever in Earth history happened a little over two billion years ago, and it was the great oxygenation event. Now, we think of oxygen as this wonderful thing, and we're glad that the great oxygenize, oxygenation <laughs> event that happened uh, because we like oxygen. I love oxygen. <sighs> it's a good thing. But at the time, it was a disaster. It was a profound change and it led to a mass extinction because oxygen is poisonous to organic life. Life now has evolved to make use of that violent reaction that oxygen goes through with organic chemistry. That's how we live. We power ourselves on that, that um, combustion reaction. But when the oxygen first appeared and life did not handle it, it was disaster. A lot of species went extinct. So oxygen is poisonous. And not only that, it may have caused a great, huge global, global climate disaster. There's something that we call the paleoprotozoic snowball Earth. It's one of the few times in history when Earth has become completely iced over and may have become almost irreversibly iced over. There's a state where it can become stably glaciated because when a planet gets iced over, it reflects more sunlight and sort of keeps itself cool. Fortunately, the volcanoes came to the rescue and pumped up CO2 and got us out of that trap. But nonetheless, it's a scary thought that a planet, you know, if a planet's a little bit farther out from the sun, maybe it could get trapped in that state. So what happened was probably at, the, at that time, Earth was being kept warm by a methane greenhouse, a CH4 greenhouse, and then the oxygen came along and oxygen destroys methane and it collapsed the climate and led to this global freezing. So it could have been a close call to irreversible planetary destruction. And my you know, slightly facetious way of describing it here is that by innocently exploiting a new energy resource, because that's all that the cyanobacteria who did this were doing, they said, oh, great, solar energy. We love it. Let's multiply and do more and more of it. They, free energy. That's all they were doing was exploiting an energy resource. What's happening? How weird. I started hearing myself. <laughs> Put the kibosh on that right away. Um, it's going to mess me up. All right. 
Those irresponsible bacteria caused a global environmental catastrophe. Now, I'm joking because I don't really think that bacteria are capable of being irresponsible. But looking at that question, what is the difference between what we are doing between us and the cyanobacteria is one interesting way of thinking about the transformation that's going on now on Earth. So as I said, we're not the first species to cause global change. So what have we got that the cyanobacteria didn't? Well, now you get into what I'm sort of grouping together as human qualities here. And these are all sort of loaded concepts, and we could argue them, each one. They're, it's an interesting question, really, what does distinguish humans from the rest of life? But these kinds of things are what are usually discussed. Language, tool use, art, technology, intelligence, consciousness, foresight, awareness, responsibility. Any one of these you could argue, but I think collectively you get the idea. They form this set of qualities that makes us human and differentiates us from, for example, the cyanobacteria. Now, somebody joked to me, and I think in a way it's true, that these are actually all the things that we don't have quite enough of <laughs> to get ourselves out of this predicament. Maybe true. But, you know, it's interesting to look at this as a group of qualities that we have, and you can ask in evolutionary terms, are these qualities adaptive? That is, will we actually, do they facilitate survival? Or are they in some way an evolutionary dead end? Could they be a potential gateway to great longevity? Uh, one can see how they might be. These are ways of solving problems. And obviously, you can imagine problems that can be solved by creatures with these that, that without these qualities would, would threaten your existence. If an asteroid is heading your way, the cyanobacteria wouldn't be able to do anything about that. In theory, we could. So one can imagine these as qualities that might threaten our survival or might ensure it. And if civilization is now a planetary process, what are its prospects here and elsewhere in the universe? Are there things about this list that can be extrapolated to evolution of complex life on other planets? So in order to get a little more of a handle on this, and, and again, working on this question of how to contextualize what is happening, I'm going to present to you a, sort of a taxonomy of catastrophe here. Here are, I've looked at the different kinds of planetary changes that happen, not just on Earth, but on planets in general, and I've grouped them into four categories, classified with respect to the influence of life. And I call them natural disasters, biological catastrophes, inadvertent catastrophes, and intentional changes. And let me say a little bit more what I actually mean by these four kinds of planetary change. So planetary changes of the first kind, natural disasters, I don't mean exactly what we normally mean by that phrase. What I mean specifically is drastic changes that happen to a planet where life had nothing to do with it. Life is not implicated. Life is an innocent bystander. So the obvious example is an asteroid impact or a comet impact. And this has happened several times over the history of the Earth, most dramatically 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs and everybody else around at that time, or most everybody around at that time, went extinct because of the drastic changes caused by an impact. But there are other examples that I would put in this category as well. What we call large igneous provinces or major volcanic episodes where the Earth goes through some sort of burp in its interior and there's a massive outpouring of lava. And some of these are so dramatic that they cause huge climate excursions and we know they can lead to mass extinctions. Uh, some of the famous ones, the Deccan Traps in India, um, close to the time when the dinosaurs got wiped out um, over 60 million years ago, the uh, largest one on Earth was the Antong Java Plateau here in the South Pacific. And the, the, um, the Siberian traps up here in Siberia uh, have recently been implicated in the greatest mass extinction of all, what we call the Great Dying or the Permo-Triassic extinction 250 million years ago, happened to be just at that moment when there was a massive outpouring of volcanic lava and the gases that changed the climate and changed the chemical environment that life needs 250 million years ago. Now it turns out that the plot thickens and that that particular catastrophe might have been a combination of category one and category two because there was a biological component to that where it seems as though 
bacteria that made a lot of methane might have contributed to that extinction. So that brings us to planetary changes of the second kind, biological. And I symbolize that here with the green leaf because the best example of that is the one I've already been talking about, the evolution of photosynthesis, which was very much the result of biological evolution and led to a huge catastrophe, a huge change in the chemical and climate state of the planet and mass extinction and all that follows. Now, the third kind of change I want to talk about is basically what's happening now. Inadvertent change. And I'm symbolizing it here by traffic. And these are all the kinds of unplanned but massive changes that humanity is inducing on Earth. And the fact that we are having these huge effects on the planet, but they're not, it's not intentional. Nobody got together and said, hey, let's change the CO2. It's just happening as a result of our success at solving certain local problems with technology. We have these global unintended consequences. And this leads to what I call the Anthropocene dilemma, where if you have a species that has global influence without global control, then sooner or later that will lead to some kind of a catastrophe. And we're experiencing that now. Uh, some other examples of this, well, obviously, um, atmospheric CO2. And this is, this, is a, this is what we call the Keeling curve, CO2 changing over time. And this is actually, this plot's a few years old. It's a decade old. And now you'd have to extend this up. We're over, we've just crossed over 400 parts per million CO2. And the consequent effects of that, of course, the very worrisome disappearance of sea ice in, in the summer and, and fall. And another example, though, that's interesting in this context is the, the, what you've, you've heard about the ozone hole, where we realized that some, what we thought were harmless chemicals that we were using down here in the troposphere, where we live, when they filtered up to the stratosphere, were having these potentially disastrous effects. By the way, the fact that chlorine chemicals destroy ozone was discovered in no small part because we were exploring the planet Venus, and people were looking, trying to understand what was going on with the oxygen in the upper atmosphere of Venus and said, oh, well, maybe if there's some chlorine, let's model that. And they went, whoa, chlorine makes oxygen, eats oxygen chemicals. And then somebody else said, wait a minute, we're putting chlorine in Earth's stratosphere. What's that? Oh, uh oh. And, and sort of sounded the, the alarm. And so this is, this is an example of how planetary exploration and the larger intellectual exercise of comparative planetology can, can help us out here and make us smarter about our own planet. But it's also an example of the next kind of change, the fourth kind of change that I want to talk about, of, of planetary change, intentional. Because the nice thing about the ozone hole in this context is that it's actually being fixed. The problem was recognized. International discussions ensued. International agreements were formulated. And it's being fixed. It's not perfect. There's still some illegal bootleg using of Freon, but it's enough so that we're on track. And if we continue on the path we're on, the ozone is going to be OK. So it is an example, a proof of concept, if you will, that this fourth kind of change, which in this context I'm saying is a different category of global change, is possible, intentional change. And now I'm going to tell you some other examples that I think fit in that category. So what do I mean by intentional global change? Well, I'm talking about change by truly intelligent life. And in fact, you can say, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm actually suggesting here that this is an interesting way of defining intelligent life. That maybe a planet doesn't really have intelligent life in a meaningful way until you get life that can enact this kind of global change, or at least it's a certain, certain interesting definition of intelligence. Because what good is intelligence? Certainly what good is technological intelligence if it's self-destructive? That's not really, doesn't seem all that smart or intelligent to me. So one might say that this is a way you could think about defining intelligence, or certainly a, an interesting and worthwhile development on a planet to reach the stage where you have this kind of intentional global change where intelligent life acting with forethought and an awareness of its global role 
and the global consequences of its actions takes responsibility. And so here's some examples. I mentioned ozone replenishment, which is already underway, yay. Now, another example would be intentional halting or reversal of industrial global warming. Now, that's currently under discussion. And you, know, you could chuckle when I say that, but actually, I see that as hugely important. It's a big change. This wasn't true. We weren't having a global discussion about this a decade or certainly two decades ago. Now, you might worry that it's too little, too late. I worry about that. But I think the fact that there is now a growing global awareness and discussion of this is actually hugely significant and, and quite positive. Now, other possible examples of this, planetary defense, and now I'm talking about defense against asteroids, which sooner or later would do in the biosphere in a major way like they did it did in the dinosaurs and their, their fellow species at that time. But we know now how to find the dangerous asteroids and we think we know how to stop them to build a planetary defense system. And it's a work in progress because uh, we, you know, we're already doing the necessary observations and people have plans and ideas about how to do this. And in fact, if we found a dangerous object and we had a decade or so, which we probably would, we could do something about it. So you, we may have already passed a threshold where that's not the threat that it was. Now people talk about geoengineering. That's very controversial, rightfully. It's not the kind of thing you want to do callously or uh, ignorantly. But my view of ge geoengineering is it would be foolish to attempt it before we know what we're doing, but then in the long run, it will probably be a good idea and be necessary. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by the long run. Uh, another example well, that I would claim goes in this category is the terraforming of Mars. The idea that we could take another planet and make it more Earth-like and a friendly place for Earth life if we wanted to. Now, whether or not we do want to is a different question. There's a whole ethical dimension of this. And I'm comforted by the fact that we don't currently really know how to do this. Because I don't think it would be a good idea to rush out and decide to do this. <coughs> I was on a panel once with um, Arthur C. Clarke. He was, he was on the panel by satellite, and mostly the satellite link didn't work at all, and we couldn't hear him, which is sort of ironic since Arthur was the, you know, invented communication satellites. But the one, it, the question of the, it, the panel was, sh you know, should we terraform Mars? And Arthur's voice actually, in a ghostly way, came in loud and clear for him to say one phrase, and then it disappeared again. And the one phrase he said was, well, I think we should ask the Martians first. <laughs> True story. And, but he's right. I mean, we don't want to even think about really doing this until we know if there are Martians or if there have been Martians. It would be, it would be foolish. But, but what I think is very positive about this is that it's caused scientists to really think. I mean, people have gotten together and had workshops about how you would do this. And it's caused us to think about how we would intentionally change the climate of a planet. And so as an exercise in trying to understand how climate works and what are the limits of natural climate change and what are the possible ways that, as opposed to inadvertently changing a planetary climate like we're doing now, how would you, how could you consciously change the climate of a planet? So I think it's been a very worthwhile exercise to think about that. In the longer run, sorry about the nerdy phrase here, Milankovitch cycle, what I mean is ice ages. In the, in the Earth, left to its own devices, in the long run is not a friendly place for a global civilization. Earth goes through these dramatic climate changes all by itself, just on longer time scales than we're used to thinking about. We do not want to live through another ice age. Uh, we could not sustain the population that we have now with agriculture and so forth. And so if we're around, if we solve our more immediate problems and we're around for thousands of years, we probably will want to do something about that. And it wouldn't be that hard. If we can have the kind of effect inadvertently we're having on the planet now, it's not really, that, it's not really a larger effect that we would need to have intentionally. In fact, it's probably a smaller effect applied in the right way to intentionally avoid an ice age. So at some point, if we get through our current moment, we'll be able to do that. Now, thinking on much longer time scales, and now I'm really thinking far future, but again, I think it belongs in this overall category, eventually the sun is going to age, and 
the Earth, left to its own devices, will go through a runaway greenhouse like Venus did in the past and become uninhabitable unless we do something about it. Now, that's billions of years in the future, but I would imagine, or at least a billion years, I would imagine if somehow we or our descendants or our creations or somebody with something going on up here or wherever it's located at that point um, is around, that they would have, a, have had a lot of time to work this problem. And so this is a sequence of ideas on different time scales about how intentional global change might manifest. Now, I've given you these four kinds of planetary change. Let's think about where they might exist elsewhere in the universe. Natural disasters, I think, will occur on all planets. Certainly on any planet interesting enough to have life, it will be changeable, there will be impacts, there will be volcanoes. Uh, as the bumper sticker goes, stuff happens, right? And that will be true. So this will be unavoidable anywhere. Biologically induced <coughs> catastrophes, I think, will occur on all planets with life. Even though we can argue about what life is and what its properties might be universally, and believe me, that's what we astrobiologists do. It's almost all we do is argue about that. But, but um, I think it's safe to say that life is something that multiplies and alters its environment. And if you just have those two qualities, then I think it's true that sooner or later, life on a planet will cause environmental catastrophes and then have to deal with the aftermath. Well, what about these last two categories, inadvertent catastrophe and intentional change. When we start wondering where else in the universe those might happen, then we're in the realm of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And you can start asking this question, are we alone in the universe? Is there something about this story that makes it a common story? And one of the values of thinking in this way is it makes us think of the long term. When we think about other civilizations and whether or not they might be out there and whether or not we can find them, you, the conversation always leads to the question of how long civilizations last. If they don't last very long, then they're few and far between. Uh, I mean, you can do the math. I'll actually show the equation for this in a minute. If they last a long time, then it's much more likely that they're going to be less rare and easier to find. So whenever you start wondering about other civilizations existing in the cosmos, you start wondering about the longevity of civilizations. And one of the values of the Anthropocene, I think, as a concept, is that it situates, situates us in, in sort of big time, in deep time, in geological time. And it's not only a way of thinking about our past, it's a way of thinking about our future. And we can ask, what is the Anthropocene? What will it be in Earth history? Will it be an event, an epoch, or some kind of a planetary transition. And in the geological time scale, there are examples of all these. When I say an event, I mean something like the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the little centimeter of clay that marks the fallout from that asteroid that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That was an event. The actual change was very brief. The aftermath was long and interesting, and we're, we're still in it. But, um, but in terms of the geological history, it was a thin layer. So the Anthropocene could be like that. It could just be a strange layer of, um, you know, water, plastic bottles and <laughs> laptops and our other debris. And, and you know, if, if, if all we do is burn our fossil fuels in some sort of orgy of consumption and don't really think about the future, um, that may end up being what the Anthropocene is. But it could also be something longer lived. It's actually been proposed in the geologic time scale as an epoch. People talk about the Anthropocene epoch. Well, if it's really going to be an epoch, it, 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 in geological time, that's often something that lasts for, say, 10 million years or that kind of time scale. Like the Paleocene was um, from 65 to 50, 58 million years ago, the Paleocene epoch. So the third possibility, I think, is that it could actually be something more profound, a planetary transition. A few times in the history of Earth, the planet has gone through a major transition such that the rules of change on the planet are fundamentally altered before and after. An example I talked about earlier was the origin of life, which forever changed the planet. Another example, well, I mentioned the rise of oxygen. I think that 
rates as a planetary transition. There's also the Cambrian explosion about 600 million years ago when multicellular complex animal and plant life burst on the scene and really forever changed the planet. So I wonder if the Anthropocene might also be a planetary transition, if somehow this new kind of geologic change that we've been discussing might be a part of the planet's operating system for, for the rest of time on this planet. But what would that take? Well, this is another way of asking, again, is human-style intelligence adaptive or self-limiting? Whatever's going on here, is it something that actually could last? Or is it something that is inherently self-destructive, self self-limiting? Um, th the answer, of course, is we have a choice. As that great philosopher Sarah Connor in the movie Terminator <laughs> carved into the picnic table in that one scene down in Mexico, the future is unwritten. There is no fate but what we make. Okay, so obviously we don't know, but it may be that our actions will determine which of these the Anthropocene will be. It's funny because people talk about the Anthropocene and, and they look over on this right side and the big debate now in the geologic history is if we've actually passed from the Holocene epoch to the Anthropocene epoch. But I actually think maybe they're looking at the wrong side of this chart. It may be, if you look over on the left side at the eons, the really big transitions, the origin of life, the Cambrian explosion are um, representative of Cambrian explosion, are representative of new eons. And I wonder if, in fact, maybe what we are talking about is at least potentially, if it's really a, going to be a transition in the way the planet operates, it might be something much more profound than a new epoch. It might be a new eon of geologic time that we're entering. Anyways, the problem, of course, is ourselves. <laughs> and Many, uh, many sagacious, smart people have talked about a kind of 21st century bottleneck that we're facing. I'm talking about people like Sir Martin Rees, who wrote this book, Our Final Hour. He gives us a 50-50 chance of surviving the 21st century. Which doesn't sound great, but it's, you know, it's fighting odds. Um, <laughs> and E.O. Wilson, Harvard biologist um, in the future of life, he also talked about this 21st century bottleneck. That is, if you look at this confluence of all these problems we're facing in areas of population, energy, global warming, biodiversity, and then these other potential high-tech problems of um, potentially dangerous new technologies, nano, bio, cyber, and experiments we might do that might run, a ro run, a run away from us, there's this sense of a, of a bottleneck, a convergence, that either we will, at the end of some period of time, it's maybe a century, maybe 500 years, I don't know, but it's it's less than a thousand years, that we will either come to a new maturity in the way that we deal globally with our, our technology and manage our world-changing technology. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. We now have technology that can change the world, so can we handle that? And the, the reason why people were represented as a bottleneck is because of this, in a sense, it's a choice, that we have all these ways to limit our future, but we also have ways to greatly enhance our future. Obviously, technology, um, you know, th these are, this is a focus on the negatives, but, you know, those of us that, that enjoy our um, lifespan and the medical technology we live with and like to think that we would stop a dangerous asteroid in its tracks um, recognize that, there, you know, there's a dual-sided nature to, to this. And so if you think of it as a bottleneck, that we could get to the other side and have a more mature relationship with our technology, or that a civilization could, then that introduces another possibility, the possibility of great longevity, where, in fact, natural disasters that otherwise would kill us are things that we've learned how to handle. And then that leads to this idea, this bottleneck idea leads to a sort of bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations. What do I mean by that? Oh, and if this wasn't enough, we also have to worry about the zombie apocalypse. So <laughs> there's really a lot to worry about. So, you know, if we, if we don't make it through this bottleneck, you've heard about the habitable zone, right? The Goldilocks problem. Well, so if we don't make it through this bottleneck, one way of thinking about it is, you know, Mars was too hot. <laughs> Mars, Mars was too cold, Venus was too hot. 
and Earth was too dumb. This is my friend, my friend John Lomberg drew this cartoon, but there's another possibility, of course, and one that I think we have no choice but to strive for, and that is the possibility of what I call quasi-immortality, that if there is this bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations, what does a civilization look like that has made it through the other side of that bottleneck, that has learned, really learned to use technology in the, surf, in the service of survival? And in my view, there's a possible state that, it, that even if it's rare, maybe most civilizations in our state are short-lived, and maybe technological prowess is usually not adaptive. But if some civilizations, if any civilizations make it through the transition to being a sustainable technological global civilization, I think they may become sort of quasi-immortal. And what I mean by that is a sort of deep enough understanding of nature and self-understanding, and that may be the hard part, uh, which gives an ability to forestall natural disasters and even eventually maybe spread beyond one planet, which gives a certain kind of life insurance policy. And I say quasi-immortality because the universe is probably not going to last forever, and I'm not sure even these really successful civilizations will be able to uh, deal with that. Well, Isaac Asimov had a good science fiction story about that. But, um, and so I, I see, I see I'm, I'm getting a little late on time, so I'm not going to go through all this really, but the point of this is getting a little nerdy, but if you do the math and you think about the number of civilizations here, and you think about the lifetime of civilizations, the way people normally think about this is there's some average lifetime, which people call L. But if you really take seriously this possibility of the transition to a really long lifetime, then the distribution doesn't look like this. It's not what we call a Gaussian with some average. There would be a Gaussian, some distribution of the short-lived civilizations, maybe like ours, the ones that don't make it through the bottleneck. But then there's some other tale, some super long-lived, almost infinite tale of really long life. And the interesting thing about that, if you do the math, this, this Drake equation, which you've probably heard of, which calculates the number of communicating civilizations based on all these different factors about stars and planets and the lifetime of civilizations, it sort of assumes a steady state. That is, it assumes there is an average lifetime of the civilization, and therefore the number, you can calculate the number, but it's not changing. But if you posit this idea of a super long lifetime state that's possible, then it's not a steady state, and in fact, you calculate that the number of civilizations in the universe is slowly increasing over time. And if they're helping each other out, it might even be increasing in a nonlinear way. And then you can get to some really bizarre possibilities, which I won't go into now. But the bottom line is that, well, one, one weird consequence of this is that it might be, uh, be true that the average civilization, the typical civilization, is short-lived, and yet the universe is dominated by these super long-lived ones because these quasi-immortals, they're sort of like vampires and that you can create them, but you can't destroy them. And so they slowly accumulate. And so what that means, possibly, is that the human process... We're used to thinking of L as our own future lifetime. The people that really came up with this math, people like Carl Sagan and Frank Drake and others, they used to talk about nuclear war, and if we blow ourselves up in a nuclear war, that means L might be really short, like 50 years or 100 years, and therefore there aren't any civilizations out there. Um, so th th there was this inherent coupling of L with our own prospect. But, but this picture actually means that the human prospect is not necessarily closely linked to the likely abundance of long-lived civilizations. That is, it may well be that we are doomed, but that there's a glorious future out there for intelligent life, but just we may not get to join the party. Or as, um, and my slide might be cut off on the bottom here, but, but as uh, Franz Kafka put it, oh, there it is, yeah. There, there is hope. There's an infinite amount of hope in the universe, but not for us. <laughs> That's one possibility. So let me close by talking about some of the debates, what we call the anth what I what I call the Anthropocene debates. This this concept of the Anthropocene has stimulated a lot of interesting and some less interesting discussions. The least interesting is how do you pronounce it? Some people say Anthropocene, Anthropocene if you're British, or Anthropocene. I don't really care. Um, should it be an official geologic era? That, to me, has become a little bit less interesting. Too many articles, magazine articles, have focused on this debate. I think it almost doesn't matter now whether that official commission on stratigraphy 
adopts this or not because it's become something that not only geologists but historians and archaeologists and ethicists and philosophers are discussing and it's a worthwhile discussion to think of ourselves in geologic time and think of ourselves as a geologic force whether or not it becomes official. Now when did it start? That's an interesting one. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and do we need to fundamentally rethink the nature of nature? To me this is perhaps the most interesting part of this. When you start realizing that we live on a planet that we ourselves have been profoundly altering, you start realizing that in some, some ways the comfortable dichotomies that we're used to thinking of don't completely work anymore. And for instance, the divide between what is natural and what is artifact. Well, for one thing, we're products of evolution, right? So we're natural, so therefore the things we do are natural in a certain sense, but also in a world where there is nothing like it or not, really untouched by human civilization anymore, what does it really mean completely when we use the word natural? And also, this is filtered into some really interesting debates in the conservation and environmental community. Have we been sort of too nostalgic in our views of conservation, where a lot of the talk is of trying to restore some pristine pre-human time but when you really look for that and look for that moment in history, it's hard to even find what it is we're seeking. And maybe it would be more fruitful to look at the world as it actually is now. And instead of thinking about the past, think about the future. What is it we want to enhance? What is it we want to preserve? And so there's this talk of sort of eco-pragmatism. And, and some of these debates have really sort of shaken up the environmental community. A lot of people respond negatively to the notion of the Anthropocene. It's easy to understand. In some ways, it's a very offensive notion. If you're not offended, in a certain sense, you're not paying attention. Is it just a narcissistic idea? Who are we to name a geological period after ourselves? It sort of carries an obnoxious implication. Do we think we're, we're sort of gods now? Do we think we deserve to be in charge? I mean, in reality, it's in my view, it's not about whether we deserve this or whether we want to play this role. It's more waking up and recognizing that we're in this position and we better assume that responsibility. But you can understand why this is, is a bothersome notion. It sort of smacks uncomfortably of a biblical world created just for us. And in a certain sense, it's going backwards in, in that science has led us in exactly the opposite direction of this notion of ourselves as being central. You can think of what Carl Sagan called the great demotions, right? If you think of the major accomplishments of the scientific revolution, Galileo showing us that the earth wasn't the center of the universe, Darwin showing us that humans were not some special distinct species but were related to the history of all life. And we've learned that even more profoundly with modern molecular biology and with the wonders produced by the Hubble Space Telescope from, operated from right here in Baltimore. We've learned that this universe we live in is incredibly vast and incredibly old. And we were not even here for most of the story. For almost all of the story, we weren't here. So there's no way this story could be about us. We've learned all of this, and Carl Sagan said famously, it is far better to grasp the universe the way it really is than to persist in delusions, however satisfying and reassuring. So that's what he meant by the great demotions. And now what? We're giving ourselves a great promotion? We're saying we're the center of it all? Um, is that what we're doing? I mean, does this place us back in the center of the story? And the answer is yes, it kind of does. And yes, that is very disturbing. But the point of science as Carl did like to remind us, is not to comfort ourselves with what feels good, but to try to see things as they really are and then deal honestly with what we've learned. And you can turn this quote around. If we want to grasp the universe the way it really is, we have to look at what's really going on on Earth. And whether we like it or not, we are a big part of the story right now. If we add up the evidence, Earth science has to recognize the Anthropocene because the rules have changed and the Earth is becoming unrecognizable. So, a lot of people, again, have had a strong response against this. In fact, here's something that was published recently by an environmental philosopher who, whose name is Kathleen Dean Moore. She called this anth Anthropocene is the wrong word. And she talks here about how, yes, we're bringing the Holocene to a dismal end, and you can 
read this yourself. She's talking about, you know, how we, we've doomed ourselves and destroyed the prospects of all other beings. And, you know, basically a, 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 an eloquent summary here of this moral monstrosity that we are. You know, it's pretty anti-human, and you can sort of understand why. And she suggests, no, we should call this the unforgivable crime scene, <laughs> or even just the obscene epoch. <laughs> now, she's got a point, but I worry about this anti-humanism as a major theme in the way we talk about the environment, about what's happening on Earth. If you look at the metaphors we typically use to describe the human imprint on Earth, there, we talk about we're a cancer on the earth, we're a virus, we're criminals, we're raping and murdering the rainforest. And, I mean, you can understand the origin of these. There's a truth to this. If you look at the patterns of our development, there is a lot that's sort of cancer-like. And yeah, when I, when I hear about the imminent extinction of some great species of African rhinos or the way that the elephants are, are, are threatened or the big cats are threatened, and those are just the charismatic species, so many others than this mass extinction we're causing. It is a kind of crime, but I just think that these metaphors for ourselves are maybe not the most helpful as we go into the future. Can we think of ourselves, can we recognize the position that we're in and yet think of some other ways to envision ourselves that help us carry into the future a more positive view of the imprint that we should be having, that we could have on the earth. And I don't know exactly, but I've toyed with, and I'm not the first to suggest some of these, in a certain sense, we're like babies. Here we are, nobody's ever taught us how to run a biosphere. We don't know what we're doing, but we find ourselves here, and we better learn to get good at it. Or it's almost like somebody who wakes up at the wheel driving a heavy truck down a road and it's going, well, I don't, know need, I don't know how to drive, but here I am, what do I do? I mean, that's almost the situation we are on this planet. Like it or not, we have to learn how to drive this thing. Um, I have a couple other metaphors, but I'm, I'm running low on time. So maybe some of you know the notion of a generation ship because of probably a two or three of you, I see a couple nodding heads are science fiction geeks. And in some sense, I think we're on a generation ship and that we're kind of waking up to our new reality and realizing we have to find the controls of this thing and learn how to drive it. Or you could say maybe we're like the microbiome of the earth and we want to try to be the commensal microbiome, the good microbes that actually live well with our host. Or in some sense, we're like the nervous system. Maybe we want to be the brain of the earth. These are all just sort of different ways to think of ourselves that maybe can be a little more aspirational. Um, I'm going to skip a couple things here. Somebody recently said maybe we shouldn't think about the footprint, but the handprint. <coughs> After all, this is what really makes us human. <coughs> Interesting idea. Um, okay, so getting back to very briefly to this question of when it started, people have talked about, well, maybe it goes back five or even 10,000 years to when we, we really started, or at least 5,000 years to when we started altering the landscape with agriculture. And in fact, at that time, not only started changing the land surface of the planet, but changing the carbon cycle. And actually, there's evidence that climate change by humans that started thousands of years ago. Some people think it should have started around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, with, when steam engines started up and we really started using fossil fuels and changing the atmosphere. There's been this idea that we should mark it from the date of the first atomic bomb test. After all, that leaves a nifty isotopic signature for future generations to find, and it certainly has a metaphorical potency of our realizing our powers. Now, these are all interesting moments in the development of humanity as a global species, and unfortunately, this has sort of devolved into an argument. People are actually fighting over, this is when the Anthropocene should start, no, this is, and because they want to make it official. And I think that's a little bit silly. It's a little bit like arguing over, you know, whether Pluto's a planet or not. Because what's interesting is the qualities of Pluto-like objects, not what we call it, right? And similarly, it's interesting to note these different stages in human presence on Earth. And I don't really care what they, you know, how that argument comes out about what officially gets proclaimed as the beginning of the Anthropocene. But as I think about this, I've also thought of a new way, perhaps, to think of the beginning that, that is maybe even a little bit more hopeful. And that is that in a certain sense, maybe it's just getting started. 
maybe it begins with the end of our innocence, with a mass awareness of our role as world changers. <coughs> world changers. Because really what makes this time, the Anthropocene, unprecedented here on the planet and worthy of a new name is our growing knowledge of what we're doing on this planet. Self-aware, self-conscious global change, I think, is a completely new phenomenon and a remarkable one on this planet. And so I'm wondering if we can define a new phase, the mature Anthropocene, marked by that fourth kind of planetary change, intentional, and regard that as something that we are trying to bring on. In that sense, we can think of the Anthropocene as something to be, that we should strive for rather than that we should run away from. And in that sense, also, it's just getting started in our conversations and what we're doing tonight. We're hopefully in some tiny way helping to bring on the mature Anthropocene. So this is where I get the title of my talk and the title of the book I'm writing now, Terra Sapiens. It's the notion, the vision of a wise Earth. That's what these words literally mean. And in order to get there, we have to become a new kind of entity on this planet. We need to, learn comf need to learn to live comfortably over the long haul with our world-changing technology. Now, one key to this, I think, is the widespread propagation of a worldview that is global and multi-generational. And one hopeful truth is that I see this worldview developing. I mean, it's very easy to get discouraged, but the fact is, with these little gizmos that we can pull out of our pockets and have an instant conversation with somebody in Egypt about what's happening and pull up any data set from any satellite orbiting the Earth. We are becoming a new kind of entity, a globally connected, communicating, data exchanging entity. And that change is not necessarily completely apparent when you read the newspaper every day, and yet it, it is happening. Is it happening enough? Is it happening fast enough? I don't know, but I think there is a profound change occurring in the way we relate globally to one another and to our future. And one question, one interesting question as a scientist especially, I think, what is the role of science in this? And there's been a lot of discussion lately in the community about how should scientists be activists you know, when we're worried about climate and so forth. And it's an interesting question because there's dangers there. I mean, when you see an emergency, you want to do something about it. You don't just want to model it, right? But at the same time, we strive to be a sort of objective voice. And so what is the proper role? It's not completely clear. It's an interesting question. But one thing that I find hopeful is that I think just by doing science and communicating science, Science itself does lead to certain values that may actually be the ones, the very ones that humanity needs to survive this transition. Because when we look at Earth from space, say, with satellites, it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. And what we see, what science reveals, is this global system of connected cycles and these long, this, the reality of the world revealed by science is long-term and global. That's what we notice when we study the Earth. So science by itself, I think, just by doing what we do and communicating what we do, it, it promotes a worldview that is global and multi-generational, just the worldview, I think, that we need. So it's true, science is deeply implicated in the Anthropocene. We have a responsibility. We, through technology, which has a tight relationship with science, science and technology are not the same thing, but they're like that, um, we have helped to bring on this great acceleration. We wouldn't be in this mess without science, but I think we won't survive without a lot more of it and without the worldview that it naturally encourages. Now, I'm finishing up here, but one of the joys of working in the Library of Congress over the last year has been, well, there's a lot of books there. <laughs> and I've gotten to read a lot of them. And one of my sort of pet side projects has been uh, something that I think I'll incorporate as, as sort of a, a chapter or a section of this book I'm writing, and I call it A Brief History of the Future, where I've been reading a lot of books about the future written in the past. Because it's very interesting to see what people say 100 years ago said about now, and what kinds of things they predicted, and how people get the future right, and how they get it wrong, and use that to try to illuminate how we're thinking about the future now. And it's very interesting, a lot of smart people said a lot of very prescient things about where we would be now 
say, 100 years ago. But they also missed a lot. And of course, what they miss are the game changers. And nobody really gets it right. And, and out of this exercise, I've become convinced that nobody's right about the world 100 years from now. The climate modelers aren't right. The politicians aren't right. The, the prophets of doom aren't right. The techno-utopians aren't right. We don't know. And I bet you, looking back 100 years, that, that's the one prediction I feel like I can safely say. We don't know. And that, that uncertainty, though, gives, I think gives us a little room for hope. You know, we can't say that we're certainly doomed because because the future is just so uncertain. But this book in particular is one of, the f one of my favorites that I've read in this sort of brief history of the future. It's by J.D. Bernal, um, and, and it was, it's called The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. And I don't have the date here, but I think it was written around 1926 or 28. Um, and no less a sage than Arthur C. Clarke called this book the most brilliant attempt at scientific prediction ever made. So that's a pretty strong endorsement by Sir Arthur. And just, I recommend the book, it's really good, but just in case you don't get to read it, I'm going to give you a little spoiler here. Here's the very end of the book, this is the last paragraph. J.D. said, We hold the future still timidly, but perceive it for the first time as a function of our own action. Having seen it, are we to turn away from something that offends the very nature of our earliest desires? Or is the recognition of our new powers sufficient to change those desires into the service of the future? which they will have to bring about. So in conclusion, <coughs> technological innovation is changing our world in surprising, accelerating, and unpredictable ways. And possibilities that until recently seemed magical are now imminent. So the future is frightening and exhilarating, but above all, it really is unpredictable. And this uncertainty leaves us room for hope and for choice and faith in ourselves. Personally, my view is that we're just getting started on this planet. And a quote from the Shakespeare Library, which I walk past every day on my way to work now, is, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. Okay, thank you very much. Phone here. All right, I'm sure uh, you all have a lot to think about from this talk here, and I'm sure there are a few questions because we always have with this audience right here. Well, this gentleman is a different species than is usually here. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope that he will answer a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> because it's really a different thing than it Yes. Uh, so I, I have this question. I'm always interested to read about people who are looking for life elsewhere. But why couldn't there be dry life elsewhere? Why do we have to be looking for water? Uh, I just a thought, uh, SO, SO2 could be the same thing as methane is to us, or something that didn't generate water, as long as you had a reason. So why are, why are you going yeah. to looking for water? Great, great question. I think I want to repeat it to make sure that's that- That's what I was going to do. Yeah, go ahead. That my mom and dad can hear it. Um, <laughs> the question is, why are we, we guys and gals, always looking for water-based life? Couldn't, couldn't life have other kinds of bases out there in the universe? Why are we so narrow-minded as to assume that life chemically needs the same things that we need? It's a great question, and I think you're right to ask it. And I think that we as a community need to keep it in mind. And in fact, it does come up a lot at meetings. And so there's a couple of answers to your question. One is that a lot of smart people have thought about this, and in fact there are people who study this and work on it, and nobody yet has come up with another chemical basis for life that works as well as carbon molecules in water. Now that may well be because we are not as smart as nature, and nature has a way of cooking things up that we can't imagine and then we discover them through exploration, so we have to keep our eyes wide open. But I think it's safe to say it may not be definitively true, but it's a reasonable thing to say that life needs a liquid medium. That is, chemical life 
liquid, you know, it's hard to imagine it in a solid because solids, crystals, nothing moves around. It's hard to imagine it in a gas because everything's just flying around all over the place. A liquid is a good place for chemicals to get together and do this sort of organized dance that life is. Now, what liquids are there in the universe? There are others. There's methane on Titan. There are places where there's probably, well, we know there's ammonia, water mixtures. There's liquid lava. So could you, well, but I mean, people have tried to think about life in these different situations. And it may be that we just haven't come up with it yet. But there's another answer to the question, which is more pragmatic. You have to start the search somewhere. And we know enough about water-based life even that, we don't know that much about how it may manifest, but at least we have some ideas about how to start the search. Now, the thing we have to be careful is you don't want to just be looking for your keys under the street light because that's where they're easy to find. And so, but a lot of people have thought about, well, how do you find a biosignature, a signature of life somewhere? What do you look for that isn't assuming that life works just like us? And what a lot of people have come up with is what we call um, chemical perturbations to an environment or non-equilibrium atmospheres. That is, look for a, an atmosphere that is radically altered as Earth's atmosphere is from the, from the state it would be in without something really weird affecting it. I mean, Earth would not have all this oxygen and other things like methane in the atmosphere without life. So one thing we want to do is just look for weird atmospheres that could be perturbed by any kind of life. And then if you find a weird atmosphere, that doesn't prove you found life, but it makes you go, aha, let's study this planet more carefully. So it's a good question. We're working on it. We have this provisional sense that water-based life, at least, is a good kind to find. The water is a very common substance, does form liquid on some planets. But we do have to keep your question in mind. And somewhere in the universe, I'm willing to bet there is water-based life. But somewhere in the universe, I'm willing to bet there's probably non-water-based life. And so ultimately, we have to just keep our eyes open. Yes, over here. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm curious why you elevate human intelligence, our awareness of what's going on, and any actions that we may or may not take beyond normal biological and evolution, you know, evolutionary forces. You know, what makes our intelligence so much more interesting to focus on it as something other than just a natural process? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, and, and it's not... David, repeat the question. Yeah, so the question is, why am I focusing so much on human intelligence as some really interesting and new process as opposed to just looking at all the different kinds of natural biological changes on Earth? And, that, you know, it's a, I, I tried to get at that a little bit, but maybe I didn't to your satisfaction. But certainly, I mean, the whole point of looking at the Anthropocene is that something new is happening on Earth. And it's not something subtle, it's really dramatic. Earth is in the grip of some forces, some kind of change, however you want to describe it, that something that wasn't happening certainly 100,000 years ago, maybe not 10,000 years ago. So that's very sudden. Suddenly, in a geological time scale, Earth is going through this dramatic change. So even somebody, you know, if, if I were not a human, <laughs> it's hard to get into that mindset, but I was just looking at this planet and saying, oh, well, here's this one era of change, you know, the asteroids were hitting, and here's this other era of change, oxygen went up in the atmosphere, and no, oh, here's this other era of change that's happening now. What is responsible for that? How can I characterize that? It's something new and different. So even on that level, I think it merits a new classification. It's not necessarily a value judgment. I mean, it's hard to avoid that part of the discussion, too. You could say this is horrible. You could say this is wonderful. But it's different. It's new. And it's worth trying to get at what that difference is. Over there. So David, Ravi here. Um, so just uh, one comment and one question regarding why what we need to look for water. Water is a good polar molecule, and it's a good solvent, which means it can form bonds with uh, carbon compounds, that which have, you know, most life has it. Uh, in it. So that's why it's easier, it's an easier solvent, so it's easier to find, make life. I mean, that's one, of, one comment I want to make. But the other comment that uh, in one of the slides you showed, um, whether we, uh, Anthropocene is an epoch or an event, I think it's somewhere in between uh, for the following reason that uh, the amount of um, CO2 that we are having uh, in the atmosphere will take about uh, 100,000 years at least to die down. So in the next 100,000 years, there will be at least 10% of the current CO2 from the fossil fuel burning. So if you go there at that time. So it, it's an epoch and the event. The event is a short life, uh, period of time and an epoch is a long period. So the Anthropocene probably is somewhere in between. And I don't know what to call that, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. By the way, the questioner is uh, Ravi Koparapu, who's one of the 
the brilliant scientist who's here for our meeting this week, and he's, uh, he's one of the people who's calculated the edges of the habitable zone, and the disquiet, his results show us the disquieting result that Earth is actually sort of near the inner edge of the habitable zone, and it might not be that hard to someday push into a Venus-like state. Anyways, so, so uh, he's not just some random person in the, in the audience, but um, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good point. First of all, he, he, I don't know if you heard, but he addressed your question about water a little more um, scientifically than I did. Specifically, water has these properties. It's a polar molecule. It interacts with organic molecules in a way that really facilitates the kind of biochemistry that we depend on. And that's one of the things that makes scientists go, oh, well, this is a hard thing to duplicate with other molecules. But whether it's impossible, you know, that's an interesting question. But his other point is that, yes, no matter what we do, our perturbation to the Earth's system is already long lived because the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere, left to its own devices, the Earth takes at least 100,000 years to kind of suck that CO2 back into the carbon cycle. So no matter what we do, we've already left, in that sense, a long term mark on the Earth. May I ask a related question about that then? I'm interested, of course, we have global warming. We have increased the amount of CO2 by one sixth. Now, there's all this water vapor, a more powerful greenhouse gas, and all this methane. If we did away with all the cows, we might be better off than doing away with all the factories. That's true. But I'm wondering, how can we say that one-sixth more CO2 with all this methane, all, and, and please don't think I'm a denier, I'm not. We yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand your question. He's saying, okay, so we've increased the CO2 by, uh, you know, by, by a sixth. Um, and, but, but yet there's also all this water and methane too. So why do we always just blame it on CO2? Well, but the answer with water is that water is passive. CO2 is something we directly do. The water responds to the temperature. So if you add CO2 and things heat up, water evaporates. So yeah, water is a big greenhouse gas, but we can't do anything about that. It actually responds to the other temperature changes. So it's a little bit of a red herring to point out that water's such a big greenhouse gas. It is, but that's because it's responding to other changes. Methane is a good point, and it's something we have to watch. I mean, it's going to be probably hard to just do away with the cows, and it's not just cows, it's rice patties. And so we depend on these things. But, and termites. But, <laughs> but, but there are other sources of methane, you know, in our production of, of natural gas, and our oil mining and stuff, and, and methane, as you mentioned, is a potent greenhouse gas. So it's our responsibility at this point to pay attention to all these gases and do what we can collectively to try to draw down the greenhouse effect to the extent that we have control over it. Okay, I'm gonna take privilege as the host to ask a question. Um, so when we talk about whether or not we're gonna survive the Anthropocene, whether we're gonna be a short-lived civilization or a long-lived civilization, it relies on, as you mentioned, us becoming globally aware, becoming globally cooperative. You know, there was a, the, uh, the development of multicellular life was uh, led to the Cambrian explosion. It shows, you know, look, cooperation is really good. Right. However, the question you know, often comes down in my mind to the question of whether life, in, as you define it, uh, uh, multi uh, reproduces and uses resources, but is life inherently selfish? and can it learn to be globally cooperative? Oh, it's a, it's a really Look good question. That. Yes, life is inherently selfish, but there are different levels of sort of enlightened self-interest. And an interesting example, if you go back in the history of life, is the development of a multicellular organism, mm -hmm. where each of your individual cells, in a lot of ways, is like a bacterium. And in fact, now we've learned that, in fact, most of the cells in your body, in fact, are independent bacteria, many of which cooperate and work com in this commensal, mi commensal microbiome. And, you know, so we are actually examples of these big cooperating systems that multicellular organisms are. And the individual cells still have their own life and do what cells do, but the in a sense, the enlightened self-interest, the collective self-interest still leads to this behavior where the larger whole does what it needs to survive. Right. And one can imagine by analogy, I mean, we've got this problem where, as you rightfully point out, globally we have the challenge of doing that. Now, one doesn't need to be completely utopian and think that we're going to 
create this world, this magical world of perfect harmony. But one, you know, all we need is a certain level, enough global cooperation, so that we don't do these obviously stupid things. And one can invoke enlightened self-interest, that it's actually not smart, ultimately, for the Chinese to burn so much coal that they ruin the global climate. Not because they're doing something to us, but because they're also doing something to themselves. And so one can imagine you know, a little more global cooperation, where in some of these obvious ways, people don't act self-destructively in a way that collectively leads to enough enlightened self-interest so that we learn to handle these technologies. I think one can allow for human nature and the fact that, that we won't have global cooperation, but still imagine a world where we have enough so that we don't do the obviously stupid self-destructive things. Exactly. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's 9.26. Time for everyone to go home and get a good night's sleep. Um, next Tuesday night. Bonnie Meinke, The Making of Moons, some amazing Saturn images and all sorts of other things. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give one great big hand for Dr. David Greenstein. Good night.